So with that, I'm going to turn things over to a man that needs no introduction, a member of uh, our Reese group here, Jim Goldstein. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, it's my honor and pleasure to uh, speak with you today. I've gotten so much value out of this group, I have to just tell you. I just love being connected to all of you. And um, I was happy to share something that's really important to me, which is this thing I've been studying for a long time, which is how is it that people come together and how is it that people pull apart. And so I'm, I'm calling it leading effectively through the first glitch. Um, what I'd like you to do is, it, it, another way of saying this is to, how to keep relationships as good as they were in the beginning, and also how to, this works, hold on, how to recover them when things go sideways. And they do. Sometimes things do go sideways with people. And sometimes you can't get it back. You lose it, the relationship is gone, you can't ever recover it. But sometimes you can, and I'm hoping that from today's talk, you'll get an idea of how you could put things back together or at least prevent them from falling apart in the first place. Most relationships start off pretty good. When you think about it, you meet somebody, you put your best foot forward, you're happy to meet them, you're smiling, they're smiling, they seem like an okay person, unless they're rude right off the bat. You would anticipate that this is gonna be good. You seem like an okay person, I'm an okay person, I hope this works. We're all kind of optimistic in the beginning. I call this kind of the honeymoon phase. Sometimes it's really accelerated, like they think you're terrific and you think they're terrific. It's almost beyond reality, okay? But that happens in the beginning and I think that's kind of a great thing. I, I like the honeymoon phase of dating and I like the honeymoon phase of new relationships because you're bringing out the best in the person and they're bringing out the best in you. And okay, maybe you can't do that constantly, but it's a good start. It's a nice way to start things off. And what I found is, ironically, is that people have almost an unconscious naivete about relationships, <coughs> thinking that since they're good, they're just going to be good. Since we're cool, we're just going to be cool. But it doesn't usually work that way. And they're almost always surprised. Like, you think somebody's going to be a terrific client, or a new employee is going to be a great hire, or a new job you're going to is going to be terrific, because it seems so at first. And it seems like invariably and unexpectedly, something drops that. And you feel like you just walked into a ceiling fan or something. Like, huh? What? What was that? So that's what I'd like you to do. If you don't mind, do little groups of two, okay? And I want you to talk about a relationship that you thought was going to be great, and then you're not in it anymore. And see if you can find out what happened. Any relationship, business, this could be a client, a job, a boss, an employee, a vendor, anybody. It applies to all relationships. Something that you really thought was going to be great that eh, didn't work out. And then why didn't it? Where did it go south? What happened? Okay, so could you just do that? A little group right. too. Is there someone who could um, just volunteer just a quick vignette of, of an example of like this where you thought something was going to be good and then it wasn't. And was anybody able to discover exactly what it was because sometimes these people just drift away. They're like, God, I thought that was going to be great. I never heard from them again. Uh, you know. But did, does anybody have an example you really knew? No, I know. That was it. That was it. And then after that. I think usually yeah. most of the reasons that I see it leads to both, it's always somebody else's. Like, I, think, I, I think it's the other person's fault. I didn't, I didn't really do anything. I own that one. Thanks, Costanza. Mine was interesting. I had a lady get off the metro one time, come over and give an interview at my office 20 years ago, 15 years ago. It was the, the best interview I've ever had in my life. I mean, I was like, oh my God, this person is perfect. Just unbelievable. Told you every single thing you wanted to hear. Tested out 100% on all the, you know, tests. Well, she was a compulsive liar. And, no, I mean, to the point <laughs> When did you realize that you were a liar? How long did, how long did well, you go know before you well, realized first, that was hard? First, first thing that started happening, we caught emails. She had a child by a professor in West Virginia, but was married to somebody else here. Okay, so she was conversing back and forth with that. We didn't realize, you know, that that part of it. But then, 
she stole money. This is how stupid she was. She gave the person the receipt. So we call the person up and says, hey, you still haven't paid? And he goes, what do you mean? I got the receipt right here. So when we confronted her, of course, she said, no, I didn't do it. And I said, but fortunately, her mother was a high-powered lawyer in the area, or her uh, mother-in-law, and I called her and I said, look, we don't have the money by here, but you know, by Friday, I'm, I'm prosecuting. But the interesting thing about it is, the next week she's got another job in the dental office. I mean, she was so good. <laughs> I mean, and, and what happened with all that is afterwards you sort of doubt humanity a little bit, and you're like so scared because you're like really gun shy after that. When you see somebody really do that, it really means you can't even trust your own impressions. Right. Yeah. And so you're thinking, oh, God. and you go out in the lobby of your office and say, hey, this is this lady's going to be great. I want you to introduce yourself to yeah. every. I mean, you do this whole big parade. And you're like, uh, it really affected me for about, yeah. about a couple months. All right. So with mine, it wasn't like a specific incident that happened, uh -huh. but it was just a realization. Um, and they did a good job. It just, there was like no, they were never grateful and never stopped mm. to like just mm -hmm. say thank you. And I don't know, after a while I realized that. And when I did, I was like, well, that, that's all I'm asking for. I'm not asking for anything else. Well, listen, I'm calling this like the first glitch, the first time that you have to backpedal, the first time that you have to reassess the relationship. Oh, maybe this isn't going to be as good as I thought it was. Maybe this isn't what I thought. And that glitch, when that happens, um, <laughs> you know, it's unfortunate. Sometimes you can recover it, as I said, and sometimes you can't. Sometimes you just cannot. First of all, I can give you a chance to come back and, and make this good. The times when it can, though, are pretty special. Has anybody, can anybody give an example of, of somebody, a client that you had, or a customer, or a person that, that there was some glitchy thing happened, but you worked through it? You sort of talked it through, or you figured out how to deal with each other, or get along okay, and then it was like, this is actually, now we're actually tighter than we were before. Does anybody have an experience with that? Yeah. Yeah, that's one where I, when I met with someone, we jumped right into the, the transaction, yep. uh, managing the property. Yep. I didn't explain what I did. They didn't explain what they wanted. Uh -huh. And pretty soon we were headed into controversy. Yeah. Sat down with them. I went through what I should have done on day one, yep. or even day one minus one, yep. kind of before I even started. They went through what they wanted. We figured out how we could work together and move forward. And from then, it's been good. That's but it was right. that initial setting up of the of that first meeting expectations what i can deliver Got what it. i feel comfortable delivering and uh and it worked from there on nice. they were unrealistic i was kind of unrealistic mm -hmm. setting wrong expectations i was looking over at my some of my closest friends and the people who i have the most respect for and i realized i've been sideways with all of them i mean we had a little mm -hmm. eh, you know thing that it wasn't cool but we talked <coughs> it out and now I'm kind of like a little more tuned into what works and what doesn't work with this person, and you're better off for it if you can if you can get through the other side of it. It's uh, my father came from a family of twelve, and uh, it was awful kind of growing up. A lot of competition, a lot of not enough to go around. It was during the depression. You learn how to eat very fast. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> very fast. You learn how to eat. Yeah, better get it done. So, uh, but I thought. How cool it is that if you can get through that, all the weirdness is who's in charge, and, and his, his older brothers were 20 years older than he was. You know, and they had the, the right to hit him. You know, so it's like he was in the, in the bottom. But anyway, when it's all done, said and done, it is so cool to have this big family, to have these get together, to have everybody love each other. You know what I mean? It all kind of worked out. It was funky, I imagine, in the middle. But it's nice to have all these cousins and. You see how that works? So if you can have glitches and work with them, recover from them, you're actually stronger than if you never had it. That's, that's really my point. Um, so let's look at the expression of this person, okay? This is obviously a disengaged, soon to be disengaged, but disgruntled employee, okay? <laughs> my son came home with this expression on his face where he used to work for Home Depot. And he, was, he took it very seriously. He was never late and he never missed a day of work in three years. And they kept giving him more and more responsibility, but they wouldn't give him a raise. And so he started off at $10 an hour. After three years, it was ten seventy-five dollars an hour. And he kept saying, look, I can't live on this. And he was doing all of the supervisor's duties. He was training people. He was doing all this independent projects and stuff. 
And the one thing that saved them was that Home Depot was sharing their profits twice a year. So even though it was only $10 an hour, which is like 19 something a year he can't live on, he was getting these $1,400, $1,500 bumps twice a year. Because Home Depot is doing really well. And then one year, I remember this, just last year, they said, you know, we're not going to give the bonuses out to the employees. We're just going to give them to the managers. That was a glitch. <laughs> okay. I mean, he was really, he couldn't believe it. You know, and he's got a much better job now. He, that was the impetus he needed to find and leave. It was probably for the best. So let's talk about what a glitch is. It's obviously, it's some kind of a breakdown. It's some kind of a snag. Intrinsically, everybody kind of knows what that is. But I want to tell you that there's three ways that glitches happen. And I, by the way, I've, I've printed everything I'm telling you out on one sheet of paper both sides. So you're welcome to take notes if you want to, but you don't have to. Um, so the first thing it is that will make you feel, and really it's, it's things that make you feel disconnected or upset. The disconnect comes from these three things. It's either going to be an unmet expectation. A couple people already spoke about this. You had an expectation. It was unmet. Okay? The other thing is you'll experience a thwarted intention. You're trying to get something done. Have you ever been needing to get to an appointment and just everything is in your way of making that appointment? For some reason, you're behind a school bus, then you get a red light. All of these things are thwarting you from doing what you want to do, which is to be on time to an appointment. You will get upset over that. That's a thwarted intention. Okay? And the last thing is that really is important to address is an undelivered communication. It'll feel like a glitch if you have to say something and you haven't said it. I told my son this. I said, look, you just started a new job. It's a terrific job. He's going to be a, a very high-end um, appliance repairman for just only the top, like, Viking and Sub-Zero freezer stuff. And they, they see him as a, somebody who's going to have a career, which is what he really wanted. I said, did you tell him that we've already made this date in the next weekend to go to San Diego for a wedding? And he said, no. I said, I said, trust me, the longer you wait before you tell them this news, the more upset you will get and the more upset they will get. Right. This is an undelivered communication. It's not, you haven't done anything wrong. You know, this was long, this was six months ago we made this, but you need to tell them that. So he did. He went and talked to the HR person. They were cool with it. See what I mean? But you could see, how, how would you feel if they sprung that on you the week before? And they're just about to give him his own truck and send him out and say, oh, by the way, I'm going to be gone for the next five days. So if you have a, something that needs to be said, you haven't said it, it will start to upset you. You'll, you'll feel the glitch. Um, see if you can just quickly go back to your groups again and find out what was it in the thing that was the glitch. Was it an unmet expectation? Was it afforded intention? Was it an undelivered communication? See if you can identify real quick. Go ahead. Well, in your case, but they don't call. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> <There's no laughs> Yeah, Okay, were you able to identify sort of what it was? Okay, most, most of the time, most of the time, it's an automatic expectation. And here's the thing about expectations. Expectations are basically killers. That's, that's a setup. You know, you have an expectation, it's a great way to get your feelings hurt. So, there's a way to sort of mitigate that. But sometimes, also, sometimes you don't know what your expectations are until they're not met. Have you ever noticed that? I gave a, I was asked to write a song for my uh, spiritual community that I belong to, and it was to commemorate the 30th anniversary of this place. So I did it, and I wrote the sheet music, and I taught it to the choir, and we sang it, and it went over well. And I didn't know what my expectations were. I was happy. Everybody loved it. But no one acknowledged me or the song. <laughs> it was so weird. The whole, and my wife is back there seething. <laughs> All the work you put into this thing, not a peep. No one said, hey, we asked him to write this song, listen up, you know? And I thought, you know, I thought, hmm, I didn't even know I had that expectation until it wasn't met, and that was very upsetting. Mm -hmm. So, 
there's something that I call the moment of truth. And that is everything's good and you're connected and feeling great, okay? And then there comes a time when that glitch happens where I say the truth needs to be told. You have to tell the truth for you. Not the truth about somebody else. I mean, the truth for you. What it's like for you. If you don't tell that truth, that kind of marks the beginning of the end of the relationship. Mm -hmm. you, you have a little leeway. You don't have to do it instantly. But you have, should know that this will become an undelivered communication. It's the truth. You have to say it. If you don't say it. I just had this happen with a partner of mine who I do deals with. And she is smart as anything. She's one of the smartest people I know. And on top of things and very organized and we just love her, okay? But I saw some communications that she sent to some international folks and she said, we might loose this one if we don't get on. I said, you meant loose, right? And then they said, please bear with us, B-A-R-E. And yeah, I had that same thing. It's like, no, 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 like that. And so that was my moment of truth. That was definitely a glitch for me. My mother was a speech therapist and a grammar teacher. I was like, eh. you know. And, and so, as carefully as I could, you know, I said, look, I want you to always show up as smart as I know you are. Okay, the, let me just show you these two things you just let you know, go out to the public here. And she was great about it. I mean, she said, I'm a terrible speller. I put it through spell check. But when words like that, like bear and bear, I don't catch it and they don't catch it. So we worked it out. I mean, I said, if you got something really important, write it in Word. It'll also check your grammar, not just an email. Mm -hmm. So, but if I hadn't have said that, can you see what would have happened? I would. I can see my estimation of her would have kind of gone down, yeah. or would have thought of her a little bit of the liability. I can't let her communicate with my clients. So you have to say it. If you don't say it, there's this thing that happens. You're connected with somebody. You're connected to somebody. The glitch happens, and then this thing happens, like. <laughs> And that's it. That's a little moment of truth right there. If you don't address that, um, it, it is, I will tell you, it is the beginning of the end of the relationship. If you don't tell the truth at some point, maybe you need to have it a couple more times, but at some point, if you don't tell the truth about that, something starts to disconnect. So here's how it works. There's a glitch. And there are times when you're not allowed to talk about it. Like at work, you can't that somebody's unapproachable, we tried talking about it and made it worse, or they got all upset and defensive, and well, never mind, whatever that is. If it's not dealt with, or if it's not dealt with well, then one of two things happens. The first thing is, you just drift away from the person. Your relationship becomes so inauthentic that there's no really point in being together. It's just, eh, it becomes superficial. The, the, the thing that you are talking about is kind of the elephant in the room, and uh, why do you even get together? So I'm sure you've had people in your life who you're just not with anymore. If you look back, though, you'll find there was some moment of truth, something that wasn't okay, uh, that was just never dealt with or wasn't dealt with well or couldn't be dealt with. The other thing that happens is, and I saw this happen recently, when I, I, I communicated to the people from my spiritual group that I was hurt that I didn't get acknowledged. And I was also felt like it was a missed opportunity. I wanted at least the, the audience to listen from like, hey, this is a new song. Um, the woman who, who I thought was gonna acknowledge me talked to the music director and she turned out had a glitch that she hadn't mentioned in a long time and used this to pile on. Like, well, no wonder you could, I didn't feel like I could acknowledge him because you have everything so scripted. Everything has to be like this and I didn't think I had permission to even say you know, anything that wasn't on the script. Like, uh, uh, where did that come from? So that's the second thing. You don't talk about it and then you end up having a big explosion which justifies the split, you see? You haven't talked about it, haven't talked about it, and all of a sudden, haven't you had that habit enough times that somebody gives you a wildly overreaction? Where did that come from? What have you been sitting on? What <laughs> undelivered <laughs> communication just sort of exploded in our face here? Did I, you know, all of a sudden that just touched a nerve with the music director. It turned out the music director had been uncomfortable with how the, the person in charge wanted it to be so seamless and everything had to be like that. But she hadn't said that, and this was her opportunity to sort of hit it. 
So that sort of was a glitch for them. See how these things aren't addressed. It's a kind of a mess. So here's something else, though, and you talked about this already. If you have a glitch and you do talk about it, especially with a lot of context around it, you don't just come in with your guns blazing. Listen, I got a bone to pick with you, you know, something like that. <laughs> um, if you if you talk about it and you work it out, you actually get to know the person better. You know what their boundaries are. Okay, maybe you violated them and they violated yours. But you can work it out. I have a, a, a stepsister who has a, a heightened, heightened sensitivity to noise. And she's super, super smart. And she's an asset to any business where she works. But if you chew gum <laughs> or you make noise eating your cat, she's like, uh, like this. And so that's a real glitch for her. And she talked to the people about it, and the latest job she got, she just said, look, this happens to me wherever I go. You're going to put me in with somebody else, but I, I can tell you, just if they breathe funny through their nose, I can't, I can't take it. So we, they worked it out. She's, she's so smart. Uh, she works completely from home. She comes in one day a week, and they're happy to have her. She's unbelievable. But you see what I'm saying? She, she talked about it, and now they're cool. Now they don't think she's just a weirdo. <laughs> She just, you know, she can't help it. That could, could have been an easy solution, just give her some earplugs. <laughs> <laughs> which, which would have. I'm uh, telling you, though, she has a sight sensitivity to everything. If somebody's wearing perfume, yeah, I got and just all these things, I just wouldn't want to be in, in that, in her skin. Um, so if you can do that that way, what it really makes is a better relationship. Scar tissue is actually stronger than tendons. I mean, you, if you can somehow put this thing back together, patch it back together, and really get to know the person, uh, you can actually, instead of being the beginning of the end, it's actually the beginning of a better relationship. I feel uncomfortable when I've been with somebody for too long and we haven't had any glitch. Because <laughs> you can sort of like, I guess we're always, you know, you go into that unconscious thing, we're always all going to be swell with each other. Well, when the glitch happens, it's that much harder, you see. So that's part of what my talk is. Do you remember this guy? Yeah. Yeah. He used to be the mayor of New York. <laughs> and he would walk around New York holding up this sign, how am I doing? How am I doing? He was like welcoming the feedback. He wanted to know, are there any glitches? Because it's very possible that, you know, you're not managing people's expectations. You're, we're not all mind readers, so you don't know what's happening. And they're disconnecting and you don't even know it. You might as well ask them. A friend of mine who was a manager of a restaurant used to tell me this thing. He said, the, the, the glitch that happens in a restaurant, um, it can happen right away, like if you don't get seated right away. Talk about expectations. Don't we all have expectations when we go to a restaurant? Mm -hmm. Tell me what yours are. You go to a new restaurant, you expect what? Good service. Good service. You seated properly. Seated promptly. Responsive, responsiveness to any complaint. Right. Good food. Greeting. Cook right. When you walk. Greeted well. Somebody knows you're there. Even if they're busy, they at least say, be right with you. Mm -hmm. Something like that. All these things are kind of under the surface, expectations. Anyway, the guy said to me, look, this is what we figured out. The big upset comes when the food arrives. You set the food down, even if you've taken their order quickly and all this kind of stuff, you set the food down, and then we train people to do this thing. It's called, you might have heard this, first bite. You've heard this before, first minute. A good server will put the food down, get away from you, you know, don't just stand there and say, isn't it good? You know, that, that's, just set it down, be busy for a minute, wait a minute, or wait until they've taken a bite. Everybody's taken at least a bite. Why? Because then you want to go address the glitch quickly. Is everything okay here? How's everything? Do you need anything? I went to Ruth's Chris for my wife's birthday uh, when it opened on opening day, which I don't recommend. <laughs> opening day. They were very, very busy. Very sweet, everybody couldn't be kinder and nicer, but they just couldn't get it right. And so they brought the lobster for my wife, her favorite thing, no drawn butter. And then they disappeared and they didn't come back. Oh my God. They're like, ah, you know, the lobster's getting cold and like no butter. Okay? And for me, the fish, they brought the fish. It wasn't the fish I ordered, but I was just not gonna say anything. I ordered, I was gonna have it anyway. I ordered salmon, but this was white, okay? <laughs> and when they set it down, I looked at it, and it was, I know some people like this. I don't like my fish clear. I can see through the fish. I don't like it. I like it like white, like a fish. I'm weird that way, but um, no one came back. So minutes passed, 
the fish got cold, the lobster got cold. You know, it was that kind of thing. So that's what you do, first bite, first minute. You're kind of anticipating and addressing the glitch. And this applies to other areas in your life as well. Here's something I recommend to all the CEOs that I work with. After a week or two, have what's called a reconnection lunch. It doesn't have to be lunch, take them out for coffee, whatever. It doesn't have to be an expense thing. But whoever hired this person, go out with them and really listen to how they're doing. And this is the conversation you have. And I've, I've had great success with this. You say, how do you feel coming to work every day? Just tell me, what's it feel like so far? You've been here for a week and a half, you know? How do you feel? What do you think they'll say? Fun. Fun. It's good, I like it. People seem nice. You know, don't do it the first day, of course, they're gonna be nervous and everything. But after they settle in a little bit, you say, how's it going? Most of the time they'll say, it's a 10. I like it here. This is much better than the last job. You know what I mean? People have been nice to me. You know, I'm a little overwhelmed, but I'm getting the hang of it, and I think you have a good organization here. Says, well, let me tell you something. We think you're a 10. We actually feel in that way about you, too. We're thrilled to have you on board. We're glad you came. We think this is a good fit. Now, I want you to notice something. There's something called, you've heard of muscle memory? Mm -hmm. It's why people are able to ride a bike after 30 years. It's something in you that, well, there's also a muscle memory of what it feels like to feel great in a place. I'm like, man, this is good. This is really, I'm happy to be here. They like me, they seem to have valued me. Just say, I want you to hold on to that experience and I don't want you to let that go. And as a matter of fact, if it ever drops to a seven, I want you to tell me, and we will talk, and we'll try to address it and bring it back up. I need you at your best. I want you to have your game face on. I don't, I don't want you to be here and uh. And what's happened, well, it usually is that they'll have some glitch, but they won't talk about it. They won't tell you, and they'll lose their mojo. I mean, they'll just, they're here, but they're not here like they were before, okay? Or you have that same thing. This is sort of like also, you know, you're talking about reconnecting after one week and continuing to it's sort of like in a marriage where you're checking up. Is that kind of absolutely? Thing? How are we doing on a scale from one to ten? I say this to my wife all the time. How are we doing? How are we doing? You know, it's worth checking. You might just think you're fine, but you're not. A lot of times, you know, we're not mind readers, so it's not a bad thing to do to keep checking and say how are we doing. And then when that happens, if there is a problem, at least you can address it. You can listen to them. You see, I did this with a guy who, and I helped him really uh, work on this hiring. It was a huge. He had a huge company. Uh, he was a regional director of a huge company. He hired an HR director, that's a very important part, because he had over 150 employees just in this one office. So the HR director comes from another place, uh, part of the eight, you know, part of his whole company, but came from a different city. So she comes in here and she was a cracker jack. She was fantastic and smart and knew her business and knew everything. So they had the lunch and it was like, she was such a home run, and she was so thrilled to be here. This is kind of a plum location. So he said to her, look, if it's ever less than that for me, I'll tell you. If it's ever less than that for you, you tell me. And they said, okay. But you don't know whether this person will or not. So he had another lunch with her a month later, and she said, he said, how are you doing? You know, how are we doing on a scale from 1 to 10? She said, still a 10. I love it here. He says, okay, because we're at a 7. <laughs> like, what? And she was so surprised. You know, here she's HR and she's know people and stuff like this. She was so surprised. She says, what's going on? And I'm going to get into what he told her because I thought this was, he handled this very well. We talked about it ahead of time. Um, sometimes <laughs> you can walk around thinking you're terrific, <laughs> thinking everybody loves you. You know, uh, Donald Trump was sure everybody would elect him president. <laughs> That's not why he dropped out, you know. Um, I imagine Michael Scott got himself that cup. I don't think it's going to take him. You know what I mean? So there's this like absurdity of thinking you're, that you're you're terrific. Well, you can walk around thinking you're cool with people when you're not and don't even know it. It's a gift when somebody tells you that something's off. Okay. So this is called expecting the unexpected. You have to sort of anticipate that these kind of things will happen. It's normal and natural. So you really listen to people. You figure out what their concerns are, all right? When he had that, um, before we get into this one, he, she said, why is it a set? He said, and he used this as a learning opportunity, which I thought was great. He said, look, 
I've listened to you in these meetings that we have with all the, the top managers. You are usually right, I have to say. I'm not to say always, but almost always right. All of your suggestions are right. But what's happening is people are telling me that you come in like a know-it-all, like your idea is the best, and that you've been done, down this trail before, and you know what we should do, and that's kind of going to trump everybody else. And they feel like, she's been here a week and a half, and she knows our business better than we do. And there, there's, this can't happen, because you're the HR person. You, you want to be the person people feel safe to talk to always can come to and feel great about you know and she was like taken aback she couldn't believe that, that she had had this impression on people she was actually threatening to a lot of people just her powerful lady but they perceived her as basically threatening because her ideas weren't what they were used to doing and stuff like that he said to her I think people like you but you need to finesse this a little bit if you have the best idea and you probably know what should be done, why don't you be the last to say it? You know, let them say their ideas first. Maybe you can get them to arrive at the conclusion that you have. And she actually worked on that. She took that very seriously. She was grateful for the feedback. She was taken aback, really thought she was doing great with everybody. And it all worked out. About a month later, it's just like, geez, they're all great. Everybody's flattened that out. But that was because he gave her that feedback, worked out the glitch, and she was able to be conscious of that, not even knowing how she was being perceived. Here's the thing, when I worked, I used to be in charge of customer service for Rosenthal Acura for three years. And when I worked there, we surveyed people to death. I don't know if you feel this when you go to a car dealership, but you, you cannot go to the bathroom without getting a search. And uh, because they feel like these surveys are very important. Here's why. They give you these five point scales. You've seen this before, right? How do you feel? You know, strongly agree. And they, if you can get all fives, especially a salesman, if a salesman can get all fives from a person, and not cheating fives, but really earn those fives. You know, I've seen people beg, please, you know, give me a five or they'll hurt me. You know, you can't do that. <laughs> but if you really earn a five, um, I'm serious, I'm serious. <laughs> That's a very incredible thing, and it means amazing things for business. And I'm bringing this forth in this example because I think if you can keep your employees and your customers and your clients feeling like you're a raving fan, they're, they're five with you, it just means tremendous business. I used to say to them, well, what's wrong with four? Why can't we say four? Four is very good. You know, it's very good. What's wrong with very good? And they found out that four is called the zone of indifference. And in all the research, four means you're very good, but so is Chevy Chase Actra. And if you're busy, I'll go to them. And there's no loyalty, zero loyalty in a four. It has to actually be a five. And then once you are, you move to this next level, and it means referral business. They'll talk about you to everyone. Think about the people who are a five for you. I have this guy who's a painter. I cannot shut up about him. He is so reasonably priced, and he is a master painter. I knew him from another a friend of mine at the company, and he was their best painter. Now he went off on his own. He's just starting. He is so good. He could do plaster work. He could do anything. And he's really, I just can't shut up about it. I am, for, him, for me, he's a five. I just want this guy to prosper and do well. Everything he does, he's impeccable. He never, if he's gonna come five minutes late, he will call ahead of time. He keeps his word, he has integrity, and his prices are so reasonable. It's like, here's a big fine, okay? This is what happens when somebody's a five for you. You want your employees that way, you want your clients that way, you want everybody to be a five, not a four, okay? Here's something else. Um, I've heard people say when somebody is upset, and that's really what the nature of the glitch is, somebody's upset. And out of that upset, they've disconnected from you. They, they do a self-referential thing and they'll say, I didn't do anything wrong, so I'm not going to apologize. For this. I didn't do anything wrong, I checked. I didn't do anything <laughs> wrong, <laughs> right? And so I'm not going to apologize. Now think what that does. I guess you get to be right about it, but what does that do to the relationship? That's why I like this. Apologizing doesn't always mean you're wrong and the other person's right. It just means you value your relationship more than your ego. I have said I'm sorry to people because I'm sorry that anybody disconnected from me. And I'm sorry that they saw it that way and I'm sorry this thing happened. 
and I sincerely mean it. I don't know if I could have done it any differently, but there is something about that willingness, especially if you're in a position, a top position. Like, I'm just sorry that happened to you. I'm sorry that, you know, that you had to go through that. Here's another thing. Oh, I didn't say this at the last thing. One thing you can do when somebody's upset, because here's what I found. You have a glitch, and the falling away, like in our spiritual community, people leave, which is fine. You know, people come, people go, they, they move away. But you don't want somebody to leave like, that's it. Heck with you, I'm out of here. Because that's leaving as a re reaction to a glitch. And it turns out it's not the glitch that has the leave. It's how it was handled. And most of the time, it's that somebody minimized your upset. You're upset, they're th they tell you you're making a big deal out of nothing. We'll see nothing, bye. So we used to do this thing at Rosenthal where we would get more upset about the person's upset than they were. And they couldn't maintain their upset after that. Somebody would come and say, you know, I've been sitting here for 15 minutes and my car is right out there and no one's come get me to tell me, uh, it's done. And people say, well, you know, I'm sure we just have to, you know, whatever the usual response, the intuitive response is usually wrong because it doesn't make them feel any better. And they say, like, well, you know, you, you, know, you, you were five minutes late and we didn't really couldn't get you in. <laughs> <laughs> Let's blow up the train. You know what I mean? <laughs> so the only thing that really worked was to get more upset than they were. And we would say things like, wait a minute. You mean you've been sitting there wasting your valuable time for 15 minutes and the car is just and nobody's getting you? That's ridiculous. Heads are going to roll for this. And they're like, hey, take it easy. Don't fire it. Oh my car. You know what I mean? They can't maintain it, you see? So it's valuable to get more upset about somebody's upset than they are, and that often helps them release it. Oh, good. You got what it feels like to be me. My son used to come. I thought he was a hypochondriac. When he was little, he used to come to me. God, I hurt my knee. And my first response was say, I don't see anything. You're okay. Brilliant. He would drag that knee the rest of the day. Get going. He was stiff, you know, the whole thing. And uh, after a while, I realized, he said, I hurt my knee. He says, oh, you did? You hurt right there? Wow. Well, you play so rough. I mean, do you think you need a Band-Aid for that? You might need two. He says, no, I don't think you need a Band-Aid. I think I'm okay. All of a sudden, he lets it go. Because I'm willing to, see what I mean? Take that on. Okay. Um, you can turn a glitch into a learning opportunity, which is what um, someone did for me. I used to go to a meeting at eight o'clock in the morning, uh, every Monday for about eight years, we met with a group of people, and we would meet at right where Georgia and the Beltway come together at eight. It was such a miserable commute every Monday morning. And I was so, talk about glitch, this is a glitch that didn't even have to do with people. Just, I noticed I was disconnected. I was like, I don't know if this group is worth it. <laughs> and then everybody's in my way. It's all thwarted intention. You know, oh, sure, just button in front of me. You know, and so, you know, the lights, it was all personal. The red lights, everything. And so, it was all personal. It's <laughs> got your name on the light. Yeah, the red lights are your name. Jim, Jim Goldstein, right, right. Jim. Right. And the person here has a yellow, but they decide to stop. Like, oh, come on, yellow, go, go, go. This is way before, you know, the, the traffic Can't pictures wait. and everything. So anyway, so somebody said to me, look, I, I get this is upsetting for you. Did you ever think that you might want to just like leave the house, I don't know, five minutes earlier, <laughs> ten minutes earlier? I said, I never thought of that. I said, it should take me this long. You know, I had this thing. I had, so I started leaving the house ten minutes earlier. My whole attitude changed. It was amazing. I was like, Mr. Generous, oh, come on, get in. Hey, you too. Go ahead. I'm so early, I don't care. I don't want to sit in the parking lot anyway. Yeah, yeah, sure. Red light, oh good, I get to rest. I mean, the whole thing shifted because I just added 10 minutes to my commute. See what I mean? So sometimes you could just do a logistical change and the whole glitch goes away. Um, what you like to see when there's a glitch is a change in the process. We used to have breakdowns that would happen. One time we had this thing happening at the car dealership where we decided we spent a lot of money and we decided to do a, uh, fill our own car wash. Okay. Okay. No, 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 I just, all right, real, real quick. We started to build our own car wash. People started complaining after, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. You're scratching my car. I brought my car in, now it has a scratch on it. And we were like, what? 
And so he says, well, it's winter, and you know, you have a lot of dirt and snow. We, you're probably just exposing the scratches that were, you know, no. So they were very upset. And so we had to study this. That was a real breakdown. Well, we saw it as an opportunity to look at that. So we had this little pit crew process improvement team, and they went and studied it. Turns out we were scratching their cars. It was the guy's belt bones as they would reach over to drive. <laughs> oh, right. actually scratching the cars. And the solution was, can anybody remember, what, figure out what the solution no was? So, <laughs> what? No, 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 we had uh, um, cloth belts. You came in, pulled your belt up, used a cloth belt, that was the end of it. But you know, so sometimes you take a glitch and it improves the process and you're better. Has anybody ever seen this show? Has anybody ever seen this show? It's called The Prophet. Yes. I, I really highly recommend it. It's just brilliant. This guy goes into businesses that have been in business for years but don't make any money or they lose money. And a lot of money changes hands. There was one business I remember he went into. There were thirty million a year and they lost four hundred and fifty thousand last year. It's like what's with that? And, and he works on these things. He works on people, process, and product. What I found was, which I thought was amazing, was that when he improved their process, a lot of the glitches uh, went away. A lot of the things that people were arguing about and upset about went away with a better process. This is really important. I don't have much time left, but I wanted to get this across to you. You know, my background was psychology. And I'm very interested in why people come together and why they come apart. I've worked with couples for 30 years, okay? I see this all the time. We have a human need for connection. We need to be connected with people. When we're not connected, kind of bad things happen. In, in, the, in the farthest extreme of being disconnected, you're like Ted Kaczynski in a cabin being the Unabomber, okay? But it doesn't have to get that extreme. There's something about just a disconnect that actually allows some strange stuff to, to go forth, okay? And here's how it works. It's kind of a vicious cycle. When you feel separate, and that's often what happens after a glitch, as soon as they made the announcement to my son that we're not giving bonuses to the regular workers anymore, there was the drift, and he started to separate, okay? In that separation, your first thought is guilt. Separation in human beings very often leads to guilt. I heard you guys talk about it a little bit. Yeah, you think maybe it's me, you know, and that's your thought. Maybe it's me. Maybe I did something. Maybe they're not calling me back because I, I, they didn't like what I did or I said something or whatever. That's your first thought. Guilt is almost unbearable to abide in a human being. And so it doesn't take long before guilt gets projected back outward at the other person. It's not me. It's you. You get it? It's them. So when somebody doesn't call you back, your first thought is, well, are they mad at me? But after a while, I'm like, what's with that? You know, why don't they just call me back? If you don't want to work, that's fine. Just tell me. You don't have to just blow me off or act like you're busy or blah, 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 blah. See what I mean? So very quickly, the attack thoughts come. I'm not saying you go ice pick somebody, but in your head, <laughs> you know, in your head, you're making them wrong in some way, and that's what I mean by the attack thought, okay? So after you attack someone, this is the weird, why it's a vicious cycle. After you attack someone, do you feel like hugging them? No. No. So you're, right, so you're more separate. You see why it's a cycle? The attack leads to more separation, which leads to more guilt, which leads to more attack. This is how people propel themselves away from other people, okay? So it's a very common thing. You'll notice it. In the gap where communication isn't happening, where people aren't connected, I've noticed that people make up very uncharitable interpretations of your behavior. They come up with reasons that aren't making you have to be a nice person. That's where the attack comes from, okay? So what do you do? Maintain the connection. You don't have to get all lovey-dovey with people, but you, that thing that you do, just to shake somebody's hand, to call them up, to email them and say, here, I'll get back to you, or sorry, I've been totally swamped. Whatever that is keeps reassuring them that it isn't them. You know, that you still think about it. Sometimes I'll drive past somebody's business, a client that I used to have, and I said, you know, I, just, I went past your office and I was thinking about you. Hope all's going well. You don't have to call me back. I'm just thinking about you. And that's it. I just leave that message. Because it's just a connection, connection. Connection. You maintain that connection, 
And what happens is, like with couples, I've noticed this, couples don't realize it, but over time, especially if you're like building a house or you just have kids or something that's stressful, you went to a new business or you were doing something, there's almost like a, a cord between your neck and their neck. And if that cord gets tight, it's almost like every little thing you do makes them go like this. See what I mean? It's, you don't want that tautness between people where each little thing annoys you or bugs you. How do you do that? By you, you put slack in the rope by connecting a lot, appreciating people, you know, just letting them know that you care about them. All of a sudden, things that would be glitchy are forgiven much more easily. Remember, people want to be smart, feel smart, valued, and important. Most of the glitches happen when one of these things aren't met. When they told my son he wasn't getting the bonus, he didn't feel valued. He knew he was smart. And they kept saying, you know, nobody's done it as fast as you, or we can't do inventory without you. You have to come in on Christmas, whatever. <laughs> but that's it. You want to make sure that people feel these three things. And if they don't, there'll be a glitch somewhere, and they will disconnect. And then they will, well, like I'm saying, make up these uncharitable determinations. This is the last thing I want to say. Glitches are normal and natural. Part of life should be expected, anticipated. If you want to make an omelet, you've heard it. No, you have to break a few eggs. That's just how it works. I'm hoping that you know, you'll see if you can understand how these glitches. What I tell people is, everybody I work with, I've said to them, look, I, I think you're terrific. It sounds like you've seen the value of my coaching. I will disappoint you. <laughs> it's just a matter of time. I'll do something to annoy you or vice versa. Trust me. I won't mean to. I won't do it intentionally. But something will happen where you'll wonder, am I really you know, helping you or not? When that happens, let's talk about it. Rather than just split, let's talk about it. That's all I ask. If you can. And that makes a huge difference. And sure enough, when the glitch happens, we can say, ah, this is the glitch we talked about, isn't it? Okay, let's see if we can turn this into something that makes it a long-lasting relationship instead of the beginning of the end. Make sense?